Okay, well, thanks very much for the uh, invitation, and uh, thanks very much for your very kind uh, introduction. So, uh, as you said uh, this afternoon, I'd like to uh, share with you uh, one of my current interests, which is uh, the use of atom interferometry detectors to look for gravitational waves, and uh, I will fold in with that uh, some discussion of the interpretation of the observations of gravitational waves uh, by pulsar timing arrays, which was uh, announced uh, just a couple of weeks ago. So uh, this uh, background here uh, I uh, stole from uh, one of the young people who's uh, working with me on this uh, antiferometry uh, uh, project. So uh, astronomers have had a lot of fun for thousands of years looking at the electromagnetic wave spectrum. And I think we can anticipate just as much fun looking at the spectrum of gravitational waves. And uh, this slide here uh, emphasizes that uh, gravitational waves offer us uh, a new type of astronomy with uh, potentially uh, many points of interest. So, of course, there's astrophysics. So we can hope to uh, look at uh, neutron stars, supernovae, uh, binaries, as observed, of course, by uh, LIGO and Virgo, uh, the capture of compact objects by supermassive black holes, etc., etc., etc. We can also uh, look forward to doing some cosmology. So uh, quantum fluctuations in the early universe might contain a tensor component, which you can think of as being quantum gravitational waves. And uh, that's something which is perhaps going to be discovered soon. And uh, you've got a project here in uh, China called Ali, which uh, maybe is going to lead the way in looking for that. What I'm going to be concentrating on in uh, this talk uh, is illustrated along the bottom row here. So the first experiments to discover direct evidence of gravitational waves, LIGO and VIRGO, are of course laser interferometers on Earth. And uh, there are projects for building laser interferometers in space. Uh, Europe is planning the LISA detector. And uh, here in uh, China, you have projects like uh, Taiji and uh, Tianjin. And as has already been mentioned, uh, you can also hope to make observations of gravitational waves using the uh, timing of uh, pulsars. Now, as I already said, my personal interest is in the possible use of atom interferometers, which I think have unique capabilities for exploring a range of frequencies intermediate between the frequencies where laser interferometers on Earth are optimized and those where laser interferometers in space are optimized. And I'll develop that point later on in this talk. So uh, what, what do we know so far? So this is a, a very famous uh, picture of uh, the, uh, which captures the mergers that have been seen by uh, LIGO, Virgo, uh, and now also CAGRA. So these uh, blue dots represent uh, the masses of uh, black holes that have been observed to merge, and uh, they weighed up to something like 80 times the mass of the sun. Now, astrophysicists say that once you get up to somewhere around 100 times the mass of the sun, uh, instabilities in the evolution of the star will blow it apart, and so you'd not, there'll be a gap. You would not see uh, black holes, stellar mass, stellar origin black holes with a mass of around 100 solar masses. But beyond that, uh, maybe you would see black holes. And of course, you do because uh, you know that uh, in the centers of uh, galaxies, there are supermassive black holes weighing between a million and ma many billions of times the mass of the sun. And those supermassive black holes, their mergers, uh, the way they interact with uh, other smaller objects, the uh, primary objective of the uh, LISA space uh, uh, laser interferometer, uh, and also the Taiji project uh, here in China. 
Okay, so there are these detectors now operating up to 100 solar masses. There will be detectors beyond a million solar masses. What about intermediate masses? How did the supermassive black holes get formed? Uh, were they formed by some sort of hierarchical process where smaller black holes were put together <coughs> to make heavier black holes? Uh, and this is one of the principal scientific objectives that we have with our atom interferometers. Okay, so here, here we are, we're looking again at the gravitational wave spectrum. And uh, here on the right, we see the uh, sensitivity of the uh, current uh, ground-based laser interferometers, uh, LIGO, and the prospective Einstein telescope detector, which is proposed uh, in Europe, indicated by these lines here, optimized around 100 hertz. Over here, we've got uh, the space-based laser interferometers, such as uh, LISA, which will uh, hope to look at uh, binary systems of supermassive black holes, and their frequency optimized around 10 to the minus 2 to 10 to the minus uh, 4 solar masses, 10 to the minus 4 hertz. In between the two, there is a gap where neither of these types of experiment are sensitive. And this is the gap which we are targeting with our uh, atom interferometers. So uh, as I've already advertised, uh, that gap may provide us with information about how supermassive black holes were assembled. And there are other topics that can also be explored, uh, supernovae, uh, phase transitions in the early universe, and so on and so forth. And then uh, over here on the left, somewhere around the uh, nanohertz frequency range, we've got the sensitivity of uh, pulsar timing arrays, and I'll be coming back to them uh, later on. Okay, so, so, so what is atom interferometry? So you're all familiar with the principle of uh, laser interferometry. You start off with an input laser beam, you uh, split it, and the two parts of the beam follow different trajectories, then reflected so they come back together again, and then you compare uh, the overlap of the two beams. You see uh, you know, shifts, which could be due to the passage of a gravitational wave, for example. Uh, so that's the basic principle on which uh, LIGO, VIRGO, CAGA, LISA, TIACI uh, all work. So an atom interferometer, you, you try to do something very similar. You start off with a, a cloud of atoms, and you uh, bombard them with a laser, which splits the population of atoms into two clouds. One cloud, the blue cloud, remains in the ground state, and the other part of the cloud goes into an excited state, which is indicated by this uh, dashed red line. <coughs> now, when you excite an atom, you give it energy, so you also give it momentum, and so it starts moving away from the ground state atom. Then you bombard both clouds again, so, so that first laser pulse was like a beam splitter. Then you fire a second pulse, which acts like a mirror. It converts excited atoms back into ground state atoms, and it excites the ground state atoms into excited state. They come back together again, and then where they overlap, uh, you <coughs> measure the uh, phase difference, the phase shift, and you're sensitive in principle to things like gravitational waves that would distort the space-time here, or possibly the interactions with uh, ultralight dark matter that would modify uh, the properties <coughs> of the atoms. So, in the same way that the sensitivity of an atom of a laser interferometer increases with the length of the path, in the same way you gain sensitivity with your atom interferometer by having the maximum possible separation of your atom trajectories, which you get by
by uh, hitting these atoms with lasers as often as possible so as to get uh, large momentum transfers. And of course, you want the biggest possible uh, trajectory for the atoms. So there's groups around the world that are exploring uh, this technology. Uh, so I'm involved in an experiment called AON, which I'll discuss in a moment. And uh, we're planning to use a particular excitation transition <coughs> in, uh, in strontium, which is interesting because it has a very long, live, very long lifetime. And so that means that you can go through this cycle of excitation and de-excitation many times. You can impart a large momentum transfer to the atom. You can separate it out by a large amount, and that improves your sensitivity to new physics. So that's uh, illustrated over here. So you have these uh, two clouds of atoms that follow different trajectories. You bombard them with carefully designed laser pulses so as to maximize the separation and to have a nice long flight time, you bring them back together again and you look for the interference pattern. Now, one other uh, sophistication in the experiment is that you like to compare uh, the interference patterns that you get in different interferometers. So what we propose to do is to arrange a series of interferometers along a vertical vacuum shaft, all of which are interrogated by the same laser beam, shown here as the red line. And what you do is you look at the difference in the interference patterns between the different interferometers in this vertical shaft. Uh, that way you can remove uh, many systematic effects. For example, you can uh, remove uh, the effects of uh, laser noise and you can also uh, minimize the uh, problem of gravity gradient noise that I'll come back to later on. Gravity gradient noise is the fact that the Earth is vibrating all the time, and that generates a varying gravitational field which acts on the atoms, and you can't shield it. Right? So you have to somehow understand how the shaking of the Earth is mod modifying uh, the behavior of our atoms and uh, mitigate that in some way. So as I mentioned, uh, I'm a member of a collaboration based in the UK called uh, Aeon, uh, not to be confused with the Chinese car. Okay, uh, so the collaboration members are shown up there at the top left. Uh, the uh, members of my group at King's College London who are involved are, are circled and uh, well, the green guys are the guys who actually do the work. They're the students. So uh, it's a collaboration of uh, several uh, British universities. And uh, we collaborate very closely with a similar detector in the United States called uh, MAGIS, which is uh, planning, which is actually building a detector at uh, Fermilab. So that will enable us to uh, compare the signals that we get in the two detectors, which are geographically separated. And so we'll form a, a network rather like the existing uh, LIGO-VIRGO uh, network. Uh, a good question. <laughs> so the, the spokesperson is a guy called uh, Kovachi. Uh, Experimentalist, yes, yes. Uh, but I would say one of the uh, principal uh, drivers of that project, so, so he's at uh, Northwestern University, but one of the principal drivers is a guy called Jason Hogan, who is a top level atomic physicist from Stanford. Stanford. He, he's not in our team, he's in their team. So, so, so the leader of our team is uh, Oliver Buchmuller from uh, Imperial College. And uh, the lead uh, atomic scientist is a guy called uh, Ulrich Schneider from, uh, from Cambridge. And I forgot to mention that on my first page, 
I had a reference to a paper that we wrote recently, uh, Buchmuller, myself, and Schneider, sort of describing the program of uh, atom interferometry for uh, fundamental physics. Okay, so uh, we plan to uh, proceed in steps. Uh, the first step being to build a 10 meter device. Uh, then, assuming that works okay, then we would go on to a 100 meter device and then a kilometer device, and eventually we would hope to go into space. Uh, so, a kilometer that's pretty much the maximum size of vertical shafts which are available on Earth. And uh, also there's instrumental limitations uh, which would prevent you from going to much larger distances on Earth. But you're going to space and uh, no, the sky is the limit. So I'll come back to this space-based version called Edge later on. So uh, at the moment we're still uh, building up uh, our experimental capabilities. So uh, the first step was to uh, install uh, laser systems and uh, uh, devices for producing suitable atomic clouds. And uh, these are the uh, setups in uh, the uh, various different uh, university laboratories uh, around the UK. Uh, and each of these is uh, targeting some particular aspect of the uh, development of the technology uh, for making clouds, intensity, quantum squeezing, etc., uh, etc. Et so uh, this is just one pair of pictures that uh, show you uh, the progress that's been made so far. So, so you start off with a sort of formless cloud, which is fairly large in extent. And you want to cool it down to a very small volume. And so uh, what you do is you pass it through a first chamber where you squeeze it in uh, two dimensions, but it's still extended in the third dimension. And then you take it to another chamber where you squeeze it in the third dimension, and then you blast it. So we got to the stage of squeezing it, uh, but not yet blasting it. So this first 10 meter detector is to be uh, installed in the basement of the Oxford Physics Department. It's built uh, just a few years ago. It's got this seismically very stable basement, and uh, there's a nice vertical 10 meter uh, shaft in the middle here. And uh, so the actual detector would look a little bit like this a, a thin vacuum tube with uh, sources arranged maybe two, maybe three. And uh, this is typical arrangement of one of the atom sources that feeds the atoms into the uh, interferometer. So as I mentioned, uh, Fermilab uh, has a similar project, and it's actually larger than ours. It's a 100 meter device, and it's uh, going to be located in the access shaft to the uh, Fermilab neutrino beam. The neutrinos are generated over here. They are fired in a direction slightly sloping down because they have to go through the earth to reach a uh, neutrino detector a long way away. So vertical shaft, 100 meters or so. Uh, same principle as what I outlined on the previous slide. Some atom sources along this vertical shaft and a laser laboratory that uh, feeds uh, into the vertical shaft. So as I mentioned, there are uh, other groups uh, around the world who are interested in doing similar experiments. So uh, on the left, we have an experiment in Hanover in Germany called uh, VLBAI. And uh, they're also building a 10 meter device, you know, rather similar to, uh, to Aeon. Um, but it's above ground uh, largely, whereas ours will be uh, or below ground. And then in uh, France, there's a, a project uh, which is under construction called uh, MEGA. So, so this is operating on a different principle. Instead of 
having a vertical shaft, it has two horizontal galleries, and it has uh, more uh, clouds uh, injected uh, along the horizontal uh, uh, galleries. So the location of this is sort of interesting. It's actually in a uh, repurposed nuclear bunker. So somewhere in that facility, there used to be a red button, which would have been pushed if things had gone wrong. But fortunately, it was never used, and uh, now it's being used for doing science. Then here in China, uh, near Wuhan, you have the Zyger project. So this is a very ambitious project. It involves a vertical shaft of over 200 meters and an arrangement of uh, horizontal galleries. So uh, they can try both technologies, both the vertical shaft technology that we favor and also the horizontal technology, which is uh, favored by the French. And then I'd like to mention also a study that uh, we did at CERN for using possibly one of the access shafts to the LHC. So the LHC has, has on average about 100 meters underground and uh, it's got uh, many access shafts and we identified one which is uh, not used very much and uh, here it is. This is the LHC going along this horizontal tunnel here. Here's a cross section through the access shaft. So we have to keep most of the shaft free so that the LHC people can raise and lower equipment. But there's a piece over here on the side which is large enough to accommodate our detector uh, and uh, the atom cloud uh, systems and so on and so forth. And there's a detailed layout of the proposed experiment is shown here. So, so I should say that this uh, CERN project is just a concept at the moment. Uh, we're not at the stage where we can propose it to anybody, but we're preparing the ground for that possibility. <coughs> okay, M maybe I just pause for a second because I'm going to stop talking about atom interferometers and now talk about what we want to use them for. So, are there any comments or questions? On what I've said so far. Yes. So, which project will be done first? I mean, which those experiments we have quite a few. So, which which one can get the delay test? So, I think that uh, I would put my money on Magis for the first large scale detector. Okay. So, as far as ten meter devices. Um, VLBAI is probably going to be first. Uh, We're probably going to be behind. Uh, the MEGA detector, maybe may, may they'll compete with MAS. Uh, but uh, no, I understand their detector less well than I understand MAGIS because it's based on a different principle. Uh, and needless to say, since MAGIS is the same principle as Aon, I think it's better. Any other comments or questions? Okay, so this is a uh, zoom in on the uh, range of frequencies that uh, we're interested in. So over here on the right, we have uh, sensitivity of LIGO and the proposed Einstein telescope. On the left, we have LISA. So these are optimized around 10 to 100 hertz. LISA is optimized around 10 to the minus 2, 10 to the minus 3 hertz. And the gap in between, circled in red, that's where uh, the atom interferometers, uh, we think, have a role to play. Now, to the extent that LIGO looks at stellar mass black holes, and these are looking at supermassive black holes, we would be optimized for intermediate mass black holes. So this is an example here. Uh, you merge a couple of black holes weighing 
10,000 solar masses, and they would merge emitting gravitational waves with a frequency around one hertz, which uh, at what interferometer would be optimized for. Uh, alternatively, you might say, well, how about a LIGO type uh, event? So we could actually observe the early stages of infall before the final LIGO merger. And our observations would, in principle, enable us to call up LIGO and say, no, in 10 days' time, in that direction, you will see a merger of two stellar mass black holes. Optical astronomers, get your telescopes ready to look in that direction and do multi-messenger astronomy. These little dots, by the way, these are, are times before the final merger. And uh, so they range from uh, one hour up to several years. Uh, alternatively, you know, LISA uh, will eventually come online, and Taiji also, and they might observe the early infall stages of a merger that we would subsequently observe, and so they could also provide us with advance warning. So I think you can see the synergies between these uh, atom interferometers and uh, laser interferometers. Yeah. I have a small question. So here are your AEGPE, so it's the space uh, atomic interferometry, right? Yeah. So the the interferometer, the arm is the same as the one in the ground, or because I see the sensitivity seems uh, they are all around the one hertz. Yeah. So the arm is essentially the same, almost uh, similar. No, the, you go to a longer arm, and that gives you a greater sensitivity. It doesn't change the frequency. Yeah, why, why, why it doesn't change the frequency? If your arms change a lot. From so the, the frequency the... is basically determined by the size of your interferometer. Right. But right, then right. you compare different interferometers, that gives you a gradiometer, and it's actually that separation in the gradiometer that gives you your sensitivity. But I imagine that in the space, the, the distance are much, much bigger, right? Yeah, so you so, get... So the peak of frequency should be uh, very different from the one in the ground. That's why well, 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 no, the, the, the clouds of atoms don't propagate over thousands of kilometers. Oh, I see, I see. Yeah, so, so the, the yeah, distance of... What's the um, benefit that you put those things on the space? You get better sensitivity. Mm. But what, what, what's the reason that uh, you get a much higher sensitivity when you put them on the space? So you're doing a differential measurement. So if you have two interferometers which are more separated, uh -huh. then you get... A, you know, a greater sensitivity, for example, to the passage of a gravitational wave. M maybe we can discuss this later. Okay. So, so I should... Since you asked the question. So, the default option is that we would have a, an interferometer which is basically localized uh, at the location of a satellite. But it may be possible to also use atomic clouds which are outside the satellite. And uh, this is uh, something which has been discussed, by, for example, by people in the US at JPL. And that is an option which we call edge plus, and that would give us an expanded frequency range. But if you just restrict yourself to if you like localized clouds, then you don't get this change in the frequency, uh, you just get a change in sensitivity. Uh, how do you get directional information in this format? So, uh, the strength of the signal that you see from, in gravitational waves depends on uh, the orientation of the direction where the gravitational waves are coming from. So, so the duration here is such that you're observing it for a long period of time. The Earth is rotating, uh, so you get automatically a change in orientation, which you can then use to uh, fix the direction from which it's coming. Okay, so you don't need to No, no, no. 
But of course, if you're interested in short time periods, then you would like to have two different detectors, and that's where the partnership with Magis comes in. Okay, so let's think a little bit about uh, how you assemble supermassive black holes. So, uh, do people here know about Lego bricks? Lego bricks? I come from Denmark. Yeah, he comes from Denmark. He knows about Lego bricks. So these are little kiddies building bricks, which come in various different sizes. So there's the small ones, the original Lego bricks. And so in this picture, those would be uh, black holes produced by the collapses of early generation, so-called population three stars. And they might weigh 100 solar masses, 1,000 solar masses. So these are the small Lego bricks. Uh, or you could consider proto-galaxies that might contain, probably do contain, intermediate mass black holes weighing maybe 10 to the 4 solar masses. So those are bigger Lego bricks called Duplo. Okay, so then how do you make a supermassive black hole? Do you stick together the big Duplo bricks or do you work very hard with the small Lego bricks and come along this longer path? Either way, you expect to have a, a hierarchical model for how the supermassive black hole is made. And along the way, uh, you will see perhaps mergers of intermediate mass black holes and the numbers of intermediate mass black hole mergers that you see might depend on whether you've got these seeds or whether you've got these uh, already made intermediate mass black holes. So that's the basic uh, astrophysics that we're aiming at. So uh, mergers of supermassive black holes, I would characterize as the, the biggest bangs since the Big Bang, and uh, we want to understand how those Big Bangs came about. So uh, this uh, slide here compares the sensitivity of uh, atom interferometers to that of uh, laser interferometers. So over here we have LIGO and the ground-based Aeon experiments compared with LISA. So you see that uh, the sensitivity of the uh, atom interferometer is in between ET and LISA. Now, e e e each of these teeth has a shaded part and an unshaded part. So for example, purple is a shaded bit and an unshaded bit. So, in the, in the lighter bit, you, uh, I think this is actually the uh, stated ink. So, in one part of it, you observe the infall, and in the other part, you actually observe the merger. And uh, so in that way, the different experiments that are optimized in different frequency ranges are sensitive to different aspects of the entire binary merger process. And this is a similar picture for uh, EDGE compared with ET and, and LISA. Notice that here you're talking about potentially observing uh, mergers out to a redshift of 100. Uh, where we don't believe that we would have been any as any astrophysical black holes. If you see mergers out of the redshift of 100, they must have been primordial black holes, which would be you know, even more interesting than astrophysical black holes. Okay, now I'm zooming in on the sensitivity of a one kilometer detector. So it goes over a large range of masses. Uh, in particular, it's centered around that intermediate mass range of 10 to the 3, 10 to the 4 solar masses. Now, what is GGN? GGN is 
the effect of the uh, shaking of the earth, which shakes the atom clouds and which can uh, mess up your interference pattern. So the dark blue, that is, if you don't uh, remove that uh, earth shaking effect. But we think it can be mitigated to some extent. And we have ideas for how you could actually remove it altogether with some sort of uh, passive uh, seismometer system. So the degree to which you can uh, deal with gravity gradient noise depends on how much noise there is in the first place. And uh, so for our studies at CERN, we uh, looked at how much the Earth is vibrating close to CERN. And uh, this tells me what it is. This is so the upper dotted line and the lower dotted line represent uh, the results of surveys of seismic vibrations at various different sites around the Earth. So CERN is somewhat in the middle there. Uh, and we then looked at the extent to which we could uh, mitigate uh, that particular seismic noise uh, by having a gradiometer system with several uh, interferometers arranged along a vertical 100 meter shaft. And uh, as you can see here, we can uh, mitigate the gravity gradient noise to some extent. Uh, and uh, okay, obviously, we would like to do better. And so, we've got ideas for how you could improve the mitigation by uh, passive <laughs> measurements as well as active uh, measurements. Okay, so I've, I've talked a lot about uh, black holes. There's also other astrophysics that you can imagine doing with uh, such uh, an atom interferometer. And uh, one of them is the so-called uh, gravitational memory effect so if you look at flot sand, so pieces of wood floating on the surface of the sea, and a wave comes by, a piece of wood is in a different place after the wave has passed from where it was previously. It has a memory of the passage of the wave. In the same way, things move and they're in a different place after the gravitational wave has gone by. If you have an anisotropic supernova, then it emits gravitational waves. And after the gravitational wave passes, everything moves. And this is something that you can detect with, for example, an atom interferometer. And the characteristic frequency for that is around uh, 1 hertz to 0.1 hertz. And uh, that's something to which uh, we're sensitive of uh, a supernova explosion within our galaxy. Okay, so the final part of the talk, I'm going to come back to uh, pulsar timing arrays. So uh, as you know, a couple of weeks ago, uh, Nanograv and uh, other observers of uh, pulsar timing arrays uh, reported a, a nanohertz gravitational wave signal. So the principle here is that uh, uh, pulsars emit uh, pulses on extremely regularly, uh, but if a gravitational wave passes by, then it can disturb the arrival time of those uh, pulses, and typical sensitivity is in the uh, nanohertz uh, range. I should say, by the way, that uh, I was a student in Cambridge when uh, pulsars were discovered. And I can remember, you know, the first one was found. And then people said, well, maybe this is some sort of cosmic lighthouse put there by aliens. And then some more were discovered. And eventually we realized, you know, they're, they're not cosmic lighthouses. They're actually astrophysical phenomena. Okay, so I talked earlier on about the uh, biggest bangs since the Big Bang. 
And uh, this is an artist's impression of, uh, of what happens. So here we have uh, two black holes, which are surrounded by accretion disks, which are embedded in galaxies, which are embedded in halos. And uh, these two galaxies collide, and through frictional uh, effects, the, uh, the uh, black holes are brought closer and closer together until eventually they merge. And when they merge, they emit enormous amounts of energy. Just to remind you, the first LIGO-Virgo event emitted the equivalent of three times the mass of the sun in gravitational waves. Compare that with a, a supernova, which emits something like one per mil of a solar mass in energy. So, so these things are much more energetic. Okay, so uh, three years ago, uh, Nanograv, one of these pulsar timing ray collaborations, reported the possible observation of a gravitational wave signal. Subsequently, uh, other pulsar timing array collaborations. Uh, so there's the uh, so nanograph is the blue. The uh, Parkes pulsar timing array in Australia is the green. European pulsar timing array here in red. Uh, put them all together, you've got the international pulsar timing array, and uh, that's in orange. So uh, this is telling you how large the amplitude of the signal is, and uh, this is telling you what uh, shape the signal has, the spectral index. Now, those first observations told us that there was something going on, but they didn't tell us whether they were gravitational waves or not. Now, since gravitational waves are a spin two perturbation of, uh, of the metric, they have a characteristic angular shape. And that's illustrated here by this uh, dashed orange line. If you see that uh, characteristic shape, then you've got a proof that you're seeing gravitational waves. But the data until this year were consistent with being flat. So maybe not gravitational waves. Anyway, so that was the situation up until the beginning of this year. So at that time, we, uh, we knew that a new uh, set of data were going to be released during 2023. So we thought a little bit about uh, how these mergers of galaxies uh, would work. And uh, so there's nothing novel in what we did. This is a generally uh, accepted formalism developed by uh, Press and Schechter, and uh, it tells you how these halos might merge. Uh, there's also a, a uh, phenomenological correlation between the mass of a halo and the mass of a central black hole. And we put the whole thing together to estimate, uh, to try to understand the signal that was reported by the International Pulsar Timing Array Collaboration. So there's one known parameter here, which is the probability that the two black holes will actually get close enough together to merge. And that's what we call PBH. It's a number that has to be less than one, and we got a number of about a fifth. So that normalization came from uh, fitting the IPTA data, assuming that uh, the evolution of the binaries was driven by gravitational wave emission alone. I'll come back to that assumption in a moment. And uh, so we fitted the IPA data, and uh, in our model, most of the mergers, which are well, not mergers, most of the uh, binaries that they're observing contain supermassive black holes weighing more than 10 to the 9 solar masses. Then we extrapolated the model to higher frequencies. Higher frequencies 
you see lower mass black holes. And if you're really brave, you extrapolate the model up to frequencies of the order of uh, 0 0.011 1 hertz, and you get a signal which could be observable in these uh, atom interferometers, and of course in LISA. Now, if you get at very low frequencies, then what you expect to see is an unresolved background. So it's a, some people call it a cosmic hum. Okay. But if you go to uh, higher frequencies, then you start being able to resolve individual uh, binaries. And uh, this, this is a plot taken from our uh, January paper. So you see that we get uh, a sort of uh, relatively smooth spectrum down here, but as you go up to uh, higher frequencies, then you start seeing uh, fluctuations in uh, frequency, which correspond to maybe or maybe not having a nearby uh, binary emitting in that particular frequency. Now, another comment that I would make is that uh, the spectrum is not well fitted by a simple power law. And, uh, okay. So anyway, in this model, we by making a wild extrapolation, we predicted that LISA would see a couple of hundred mergers per year, that EDGE would see a couple of hundred mergers per year, and Aeon one kilometer might see a few. So that was January. Now we're in July. So what happened in June? So uh, in June, Nanograv released their 15-year uh, data sample, and uh, now they claim at a level of 3.5 or 4 <coughs> sigma to see the typical angle of correlation expected from gravitational waves. Uh, and the existence of this correlation uh, was uh, calculated many years ago by Hellings and Downs, and Nanograv claim a Bayesian evidence for this of 200, whatever that means. Anyway. So uh, other pulsar timing array collaborations uh, announced their results at the same time. So uh, here are the results from the European pulsar timing array. So uh, a similar sort of uh, frequency dependence. Uh, also a hint of this uh, angular correlation, Bayes factor of 65. The Parkes Pulsar Timing Ray in Australia also announced their results, and uh, although there may be a hint of this Hellings Downs angular correlation, it's not significant, Bayes factor 1.5. And the Chinese Pulsar Timing Ray also announced results. And uh, they also seem to find evidence for Hellings Downs angular correlation, although they didn't analyze the data in, in quite the same way. They couldn't see the time duration is so short. But now they can also get the for instance the index is gamma or any kind of thing. Right. In the future they, they might. Right. But they can get the angular correlation. Right, right, right. And so they claim to see an angular correlation. Right, right. But uh, as, I, as you were saying, they're limited in what they can do. But uh, I think they're going to develop very fast, if you don't I, mind the expression. I think in the future, you know, we probably can expect much more from the CPTA. Yeah, well, they've got you know, one of the largest radio telescopes on the planet. And uh, so if they devote a lot of observing time to this, then they can do something very interesting. Okay, now, uh, this model of supermassive black hole mergers predicts a very particular spectral index, uh, gamma, which is four and one third. The data from Nanograv 
a little bit off that. As I mentioned earlier, actually in our simulation we find that that spectral index, that you know, simple power law, is not a good uh, representation of what the model predicts. And that's also what Nanograph found. So the model would predict four and one third, but actually when they do a simulation in that model, they get a somewhat different result and the data indicates something different again. So I think all this is telling us that analyzing things in terms of a simple spectral power is not a good thing to do. But certainly there's a prima facie disagreement between this uh, supermassive black hole merger prediction. If the black holes lose energy only through gravitational wave emission. So this, is, this picture here is taken from the nanograv paper. Uh, in our simulation, we got similar results. So we're on the same wavelength, so to speak. So the simplest interpretation of this is that there was some additional energy loss beyond that due to emission of gravitational waves. And the most natural thing to think of is that there is some interaction between the binary system and the host galaxy. It might be interaction with gas, it might be interaction with stars, it might be interaction with dark matter, who knows? But very likely, these black holes are still feeling the effect of the environment during their evolution. And the faster they evolve, then the fewer gravitational waves they will have time to emit. And so this is a simple set of formulae which describe that the total energy loss rate from gravitational waves and from the environment. <coughs> for gravitational wave emission, you can calculate, but then when you calculate the total amount of energy emission, is going to be suppressed if there is, in addition, this environmental energy loss. And uh, there's different models for that, but we just chose a simple parameterization uh, for uh, what this effect looks like as a function of frequency. So uh, this compares uh, simulations done with gravitational waves alone, gravitational waves plus uh, energy loss, and we found that including energy loss gave a better fit to the, uh, to the data. And as you can see, uh, these fluctuations in the data seem to be closer to the nanograph sensitivity, suggesting that it's possible that nanograv is beginning to see individual binaries. So this compares the nanograv data shown in yellow with a gravitational wave alone model shown in blue and gravitational waves plus environmental effects shown in green. But we're well, just the black holes interacting with the galaxy, with the halo, and losing energy through interaction oh. with the okay. So, for those of you who are not familiar with it, uh, these so called violin shapes give you the probability density function for the amount of energy emitted. So, in the yellow case, that's the uncertainty in the experimental measurement. And in the blue and green case, this is the uh, stochastic variation in our model simulations. And what we do is we compare directly our violins with the experimental violins. So we don't look at spectral shapes. We look directly at the data. And it's clear, just looking at this picture, that the green violins the data better than the blue ones. And so we would claim that there is significant evidence 
that there is indeed this environmental effect in addition to gravitational wave emission. And uh, I won't go through the details of this. Uh, you can look at our paper. So there are other interpretations. Now I'll come to, come to that in a moment. Anyway, if you put in these environmental effects, then you find that the PBH that you need to fit the data is larger. And that means that the prospective signals in LISA, EDGE, and AON are larger. So we predict now, you know, maybe a thousand events per year in LISA, maybe a thousand events per year in EDGE, and uh, you know, maybe a dozen or so events in uh, AON one kilometer. Okay, so you're saying, well, maybe there's other explanations. And so we've, we're studying various different uh, cosmological theories that might predict something like the data. I, I just have time for, for one, which is cosmic strings. So the idea is that uh, you have some uh, particle physics mechanism for producing strings of energy. These move around uh, in the gravitational field uh, of the universe. Uh, sometimes they cross each other. And uh, when they cross each other, they may switch their affiliations. That's called intercommutation. The simplest models of cosmic strings, the probability is one for intercommutation, uh, but it could be less than one. And in particular, superstrings and QCD strings uh, maybe give you a probability less than one. So uh, we did uh, a fit to uh, the data. Uh, these dots here represent various specific models that I'll come back to in just a moment. Uh, this model is constrained actually by the existing uh, ligo virgo uh, Kagra data, but there's a, a region of parameter space for this cosmic string model, which is compatible uh, with their constraints, although much of it will be explored by uh, future runs of the... Uh, Sorry? I'm a super string. Right, because that's one example of a string where the intercommutation probability is less than one. It's not actually the only one, but this is the you perhaps the most popular. One one? Sorry? So a super string model, you mean really from like uh, what kind of string model you have in mind? Or? Because like really we have some string model. Maybe. Yeah, so this would be this some... Yes, was, was studied before, but I'm not so sure. What's the energy scale? Because this energy scale may not be the I'll discuss that in just half a second. Okay. okay. Well, actually, it's already here. Sorry. So, so this is the uh, string tension. Oh, this is real string tension? Yeah. Can we go to 17 GeV? Well, but, but, that's all that I said. No, so this is, this would be uh, a scale of the order, yeah, 10 to the Something teen uh, GV. Oh, you're not, you're not so, uh, these are uh, some of the uh, fits to nanograph data that we did. Uh, th these are not sort of optimized, but uh, typically we find that uh, you can fit the data if the intercommutation probability is between. 0.1 and 0.01. Now the interesting thing is you know, what prediction does this model make? So the astrophysical model said that uh, you get now a sort of string of, uh, of uh, energy distributions from black holes of different masses. The string prediction is that you get basically a flat spectrum. And that flat spectrum would be observable uh, in future runs of uh, LVK. And of course, these are 
and of course uh, variants of Aeon. So we asked ourselves how robust is that prediction? And the answer is it's very robust. Uh, we looked at uh, postulating, for example, a period of matter domination during the subsequent evolution of the universe. And the maximum amount of such an epoch that you can accommodate would still keep the cosmic string prediction observable for Aeon and Lisa, but not for future LIGO, Virgo, CAGRA observations, although it would be sensitive. Uh, it would be detectable with the Einstein telescope. And the same thing is true if you postulate some uh, epoch of uh, thermal inflation in the history of the universe. So cosmic strings make the robust prediction that you should be able to detect the signal in uh, other experiments. Uh, in the case of the astrophysical interpretation, that I would say is somewhat less certain. The astrophysical interpretation says that you should start seeing individual binaries, but the cosmic string interpretation, you just get a perfectly smooth spectrum. Oh, here's another one, Dwayne Walls. Okay, I, I, I won't go into this in any detail. Last slide. So uh, earlier on this year, we organized at CERN a uh, workshop on uh, terrestrial very long baseline atom interferometry. We decided to bring together the international community who was interested in such detectors with the idea of uh, coordinating efforts towards construction of uh, one or more kilometer scale atom interferometers uh, in the future. And uh, we're currently preparing our summary report. Uh, if you like the idea, you're invited to sign on as a supporter of the project. And uh, then we plan to actually try to put together a proto collaboration, which would then coordinate the projects at a, a, a deeper level and would act as a sort of representative of the community uh, talking to funding agencies and laboratories. Thank you. Do we have some questions or comments? Okay. So I have um, one other question, some general question. So for these atomic interferometries, uh, do they also have this so-called standard quantum limit? And uh, are there any ways to do them you know, beyond this uh, kind of standard quantum so, so, limit? And so, the sensitivity, how far is it from the standard quantum limit? Yeah, so, so uh, there are ways of uh, getting around that by uh, squeezing your uh, atom right, class. Squeezing is not a very good one. It's only order one effect to some extent. Well, maybe order 10. Right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Most. So, so anyway, that's something which uh, the team at Imperial College London uh -huh. is planning to work on. Uh -huh. uh, so they're actually making the most rapid progress in our team uh -huh. uh, for uh, getting for manipulating these atom clouds. Uh -huh. And uh, like I said, th their job is to uh, demonstrate squeezing. I see, I see. So currently what you know is the squeezing? Not, not yet. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so I, I think that there's another thing I want to ask is, so uh, there's something, for instance, if you're looking at the binary and uh, the gravitational waves uh, passing by, the binary trajectory will change. They will also accumulate, you know, this uh, change of the trajectory and this paper has been done by the people you mentioned the Dago Blas and uh, if we're looking at the earth and the moon so the lunar earth system actually they correspond to the frequency detecting sensitivity is also the same as the the atomic interferometry so is there anything people really compare the two or you know, especially when we can measure, you know, very precisely the distance for the Earth and the Moon. And the well, I think this is a very interesting idea. Right, right. And uh, Diego Blas is one of my big buddies, uh -huh. and he's a member of the Aeon Collaboration. Uh -huh. But I'm a little bit skeptical. Really? Yeah, yeah, I, I see that. I, 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 because I also work on that, and I think there are still some systematic uh, yeah, right, somehow right. it's not in the paper, but uh, right, 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 right. I think we're on. I think we're on the same wavelength. 
Uh, but, but, but I might mention that there are similar ideas proposed mm. by the uh, Stanford group, uh, Peter Graham and collaborators, when? That, that you could put uh -huh. uh, detectors on asteroids and that they would give oh, you... Oh, yeah, yes, Sugi and... Uh, yeah, they would give you sensitivity in this range over here. Yeah, I, 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 I know this paper. Yeah. So the, the last question is that for this edge and uh, Lisa, who will give the data, for real data first? Uh, Lisa. Lisa. So, yes. so I still something far beyond. Or... I mean, we, we need to mm. show that we can really do what we think we can do. And that's going to take us some time. The, the laser people are certainly ahead of us. But, uh, yeah. With a little bit of luck, uh, maybe we could get Edge into space before my 100th birthday. <laughs> <laughs> I see. And more questions? Okay. Because our time is uh, kind of up, uh, so maybe let's just thank Professor Jonas. Yeah. Thank you very much.